by kicking off this afternoon um, with a, a lecture by Alan Wolf, who is, you know, is director here at Boston College of the Blasey Center for Religion and American Public Life. And I'm not Charlie Rose, so I'm not going to go down his whole list of considerable uh, accomplishments. So please join me in welcoming Ellen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all for coming and spending this day together talking about really interesting topics. Well, Alan Ryan began with a man named Friedrich von Hayek, so I'm going to begin with him too. Um, Hayek, who was a great believer in both the efficacy and ethical superiority of free markets, once wrote an essay called Why I Am Not a Conservative. He was correct, I believe. His version of laissez-faire allowed little room for tradition, religion, locality, and other concepts that had characterized the thoughts of earlier conservatives, such as Edmund Burke, and more contemporary ones, like Michael Oakeshott. The fact that Hyatt was not a conservative, however, in no way implies that he was a liberal. It is true that like Adam Smith, Hayek was a believer in laissez-faire, but if the policy prescriptions were the same between them, the underlying messages could not have been more different. Smith's free market would liberate individuals from the caprices of an, inf of an inflexible mercantilism. Hayek's free market would chain individuals to a system of rules over which they had no control and could not by themselves fully understand. The liberal tradition to which Smith belonged and the libertarian one, which includes Hayek, not only have little in common or most dimensions of political philosophy, they are on quite different sides. In this day when Uber cars arrive on time and taxi cabs do not, libertarian, libertarianism is hailed by many as the solution to an economy and a society stuck in its own bureaucratic mud. So let me be clear that in speaking ill of libertarianism, and I do mean to speak ill of it, I am not speaking against specific policies that break up monopolies in favor of a greater emphasis on choice. While I have some misgivings about school vouchers, I also believe that so long as well-off individuals can choose schools for their own children by moving to wealthy suburbs, inner city parents, as much as possible, should have the same kind of flexibility. When the United States seems determined to intervene abroad, a volunteer army, which itself has much wrong with it, may well be preferable to a compulsory draft. There is nothing wrong with and much right about relying on private institutions such as churches to help those who cannot help themselves. We should be open to a variety of ways of making government function better. Libertarianism, however, is not just a set of policy prescriptions. It is an ideology. Without doubt, the most ideological of all the political ideas of movements floating around among those who think about the proper relationship between the individual and the state. It is, moreover, a total ideology, one that considers every aspect of how people live and proposes solutions for all of them. There is a libertarian way of riding a bicycle, taking your medicine, finding a spouse, giving blood, and as already suggested, calling a cab. Liberalism raises questions. Libertarianism seeks answers and always finds the right ones. Libertarianism is an antidote to the doubt, inconsistency, and vagueness that has always been built into liberalism. There is nothing tentative, nothing haphazard, nothing weak need about libertarianism. If you believe in God, respect hierarchy, hierarchy, and venerate tradition, you can oppose liberalism by becoming a conservative. If you prefer a social order that hides its authoritarianism behind opaqueness, you can become a libertarian. It is for this reason that while I recognize that liberal, libertarians come in different forms and frequently argue over every concept in which they claim to believe, there is, noth there is nonetheless a general outlook on life called libertarianism that can be analyzed in the same way one speaks of asparagus or broccoli. I will in what follows flesh out this argument by contrasting liberalism and libertarianism 
on a series of questions that have preoccupied their advocates over the years. The best place to start, I believe, is the same place where all these thinkers start and where we began this morning, and that is with the mystery known as human nature. He who lets the world choose his plan of life for him, John Stuart Mill famously observed in On Liberty, has no need of any other faculty than that of ape-like imitation. Mills's essay was published in 1859, 10 years before Charles Darwin came out with The Origin of the Species. Apes, shall we say, were very much in the news at the time, and it can hardly be a surprise that, uh, uh, that when Mill would seek a creature meant to be different than that of human beings, he would make the comparison to a being that was neither homo nor sapien. Mill's inspiration for On Liberty were the writings of Wilhelm von Humboldt, who added a touch of German romanticism to English ideas about individualism. We live for more than simply being free, Humboldt reminded his readers. We live to improve and then to make and remake ourselves in a never-ending state of self-development. Apes do not. Where Mill writing today, the more appropriate point of comparison to human beings and their nature would likely come from technology rather than biology. Computers do many of the things we human beings do, and they do them in ways far superior to us. But even those impressed with the, with the ability of computers to play chess or translate a language are generally unwilling to predict the capacity of such machines to love, to be influenced by their conscience, or to change their mind depending upon the immediate context surrounding them. Liberty is for people. Its exercise requires a being sufficiently mature and knowledgeable to know how to put the liberty to good use. Mill, I have no doubt, would be appalled by the efforts of the US Supreme Court to insist that artificial entities such as corporations have rights to free speech, or even more appallingly, to freedom of religion. Corporations may, although most do not, improve their behavior, but they do not do so through the process of self-development that Humboldt described. Libertarians, such as those at the Cato Institute, endorsed the reasoning in Citizens United, the decision that treated corporations as persons by granting them free speech. Aside from any issues of fairness, increasing the influence of those already influential would fail to meet most standards of fairness. They also, that is libertarians, displayed a blatant disregard of the humanism that motivated so many of the liberals of the past, not only Mill, but John Dewey and Isaiah Berlin as well. Computers, quote unquote, think by following mathematical rules known as algorithms. So libertarians would have it should human beings. Seemingly free to make our own decisions, we would, in a libertarian world, be the slaves of the rules that conform our choices to the rigidities of marketplace rationality. We would, if proper libertarians, not only give special preference, we would, if we were proper libertarians, refuse to give special preference to our loved ones merely because we love them. We honor and admire our country, but only libertarians believe uh, we do so because we believe our country resembles the libertarian ideal. If it did not, if our country's citizens voted in, voted in an entirely different system based on principles of general, generalized altruism, libertarians would not only hate it, they would seek its destruction, much like John Galt and his followers did in Atlas Shrugged. Emotions such as envy, guilt, and sympathy would be forbidden to us in a libertarian world. There would only be one proper way to think and hence to act. In libertarianism, choice is omnipresent, but choices are not. The objective, in fact, is to eliminate choices by forcing everyone to choose the same thing. What libertarians call freedom, liberals such as Mill called imitation. Human nature, libertarians insist, is one thing and one thing only. Great Creative capitalists, they believe, understand this. Everyone else, including capitalists entranced by the idea of leaving a legacy, 
are suffering from what Marxists would call false consciousness. Better than any liberal thinker with which I am familiar, indeed better than any conservative either, libertarianism embodies Max Weber's nightmare of an iron cage. Specialists without spirit, as he put it, sensualists without heart. Weber lamented the restrictions of the iron cage that entrap us inside its severe rationality. Libertarians praise those very restrictions. Any motive other than rationality is a lower one. We are born to think, and the best among us are those that think the hardest, no matter what consequences their thinking leads to. Consequences are irrelevant to the libertarian. One must never be distracted from the goal at hand, which is to act in accord with what is assumed but never proved to be our nature. I want to talk a little bit about libertarians' relationship to the concept of power. Ayn Rand, the quintessential libertarianism, did not develop her ideas all by herself. When she was younger, she met and befriended other libertarian thinkers especially two prominent women. One, Rose Wilder Lane, who was the daughter of the author of Little House on the Prairie, and the other, Isabel Patterson, who was a leading con uh, columnist and book reviewer for the New York Herald, soon to be the Herald Tribune. Patterson and, and Rand, in particular, were made for each other. They developed the kind of friendship in which they were capable of finishing each other's sentences, and the latter, Patterson, helped the former, Rand, uh, by reviewing the Fountainhead and giving it huge attention in her newspaper. Both these highly successful women were too competitive and individualistic, however, to sustain a friendship for very long. Rand eventually broke with Patterson for many reasons, but especially because she felt slighted by Patterson's uh, uh, unwillingness, as Rand saw it, to praise her to the extent that she thought she should be praised. Her hostility extended to the point of pretending that Patterson did not even exist. Erasing Patterson's contribution, quote, erasing Patterson's contribution made Rand into the completely autonomous heroine of her own personal narrative, wrote I Am Rand's biographer, Jennifer Burns. Quote, she would come to believe that her individual effort had solely shaped her ideas and driven her work excluding her participation in the intellectual world that Patterson represented. For the rest of her life, Rand would go out of her way to cultivate, cultivate followers, only then to renounce them if they showed in any way themselves insufficiently devoted to her. Those attracted to the Rand cult lived in fear that they would face excommunication, be judged negatively by their peers. Um, cut off from their guru, and doomed, oddly enough, her believers in individualism to find their own way in the world. Even Rand's most devoted follower and eventual lover, Nathaniel Brandon, would be forced out of the closed circle, similar in method, if not in result, to the way Stalin eliminated those closest to him. This woman who led this, left the Soviet Union in its infancy mimicked in her own life that regime's worst features. It's not just Rand. The Koch brothers brought themselves influence in the Cato Institute, once a quasi-respectable libertarian think tank, and immediately began to rid themselves of those, such as Cato's then president, Ed Kane, who wanted the organization to be able to attract libertarians who were not, in partisan sense, Republicans. Like Rand, the Koch brothers were of a my way or the highway disposition. They wanted to be individualists by surrounding themselves with those, only with those who were in complete agreement with them. And as for that agreement, it is worth saying that it had to be truly and totally and devotedly complete. Koch, that's Charles Koch, called out Milton Friedman and Alan Greenspan specifically as sellouts to the system wrote Brian Doherty, a historian quite sympathetic to the movement. Merely trying to make government work more effectively, Koch believed of uh, Greenspan and Friedman that they were merely trying to make government work more effectively rather than what libertarians should be doing is tearing it out 
at the, at the root. Both Rand and Charles Koch praised a free society, and both did so from a perspective that allowed of no dissent. Name a libertarian, no matter how extreme, and you will always find that libertarian believing that another libertarian was too wishy-washy. Murray Rothbard, who was mentioned by Alan Ryan this morning, was one of those rejected from the Randian inner circle because of his failure to conform to the dictates of, his, of the mistress. He called the Randians posturing, pretentious, humorless, robotic, nasty, simple-minded jackasses. <laughs> Wonderfully put, I think, but then Rothbard himself had no taste for anyone he considered soft. Milton Friedman is the establishment court's libertarian, he once opined, and it's high time to call a spade a spade and a statist a statist. Rand herself, by the way, dismissed Milton Friedman and George Stigler, another Chicago economist and libertarian, as, quote, a pair of reds. And of Friedrich von Hayek, she said that he was real poison who does more to the communist cause than to ours, than to us, than the cause of libertarians. These denouncers of the insufficiently committed were true to the founders of the movement. One of them, the Austrian Ludwig von Mises, referred to all the other libertarian thinkers as a bunch of socialists. It may have been von Mises' harsh judgmentalism and not his ideas that prevented him from ever getting a regular academic appointment. Both um, von Mises and von Hayek were appointed to universities based on outside funding uh, from a, a, an organization called the Volcker Foundation, no relationship to William Volcker, which was an early model of the Koch brothers. In the world of libertarianism, everyone is suspect until proven innocent, which may help explain by one libertarian, may help explain why one libertarian organization, the Circular Bastiat, looked favorably upon the antics of Senator Joseph McCarthy, while others, including that apostle of freedom, Ayn Rand, chose to become a friendly witness before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Why this closed-minded and tightly guarded maintenance of the libertarian movement? The key may lie in the term libertarian organization. It is most difficult to be a passionate advocate for freedom and simultaneously a member of a tightly lit group. Libertarians are not always faithful followers of their own creeds, but on this point, they are consistent. Individualistic to the core, uh, when it comes to their world, although not the real world, Margaret Thatcher had it right when she said that there is no such thing as society. It should therefore come as no surprise that as much as they may hate the left, libertarians copy leftists so often in their behavior. The leader, when it came to such copycatting, was Murray Rothbard a figure who looked and acted like a left-winger, even as he became one of the most extreme libertarians on the right. Rothbard, Doherty, the historian of libertarian, writes, quote, delights in defending the shocking conclusions to which his pure property rights libertarianism leads. He insists, for example, that libel cannot be a crime. By the way, can anyone imagine why libel should not be a crime? I could never have gotten to this place, I must say, my own. Uh, since your reputation consists of thoughts in other people's heads, it's not your property. You don't own your own reputation. Uh, therefore, um, he was against libel laws as excessive state interference into individual behavior. Lenin was not admired by all libertarians, but Rothbard admired him greatly. Always a conscious student of movement strategy, his biographer writes, um, uh, Rothbard looked to successful ideological revolutionaries of the past, such as Lenin, for strategic insights into how to effect ideological changes on a national level. One of Rothbard's pet Leninist tropes was the idea of the cadre, the dedicated inner circle of revolutionaries 100% reliable in ideology and action around which a movement could crystallize. 
Rand, as we have seen, approached politics much in the same way. It is not just in her fiction, which as one of her biographers points out, so closely resembled Soviet realism. When John Galt and his friends leave society behind for their hiding place in the Colorado mountains, they are acting like any Leninist vanguard would. In essence, concludes the journalist Jonathan Chait in one of the best analyses of Rand's influence I have read, Rand advocated a reverse Marxism. In the Marxist analysis, workers produce all the value and capitalists merely leech off their labor. In Rand, it is the exact opposite. Libertarians like to think of themselves like Montesquieu or Madison as extremely wary of power and always on the side of limiting its reach. In reality, these are people who hate the state but love power. They advance liberty by demonstrating all the characteristics of the authoritarian personality. Everything must be their way or they will use their power to destroy it. More than anything else, this is where liberalism and libertarianism take different paths. As features such as Cass Dun Sunstein and Stephen Holmes have demonstrated, rights are indeed checks against the arbitrary power of the state. But in the absence of power to protect their rights, people have no such protection. They require the state and its, and its ability to further human development in order to limit the state with a capital S. No such paradoxes are available to the libertarian mind. A is A, Rand repeatedly proclaimed. Perhaps that's true of Soviet realism. It is not true in the messy reality of modern liberal democracy. I've talked a little bit about human nature and a little bit about politics. Now I want to say something about violence. There is nothing that libertarians consider themselves more against than the use of force or coercion. The great sin of government regulation, in their view, is not that it promotes equality. Most likely, they insist, it will not, but that it involves coercion. Regulation, government regulation, as the libertarian law professor Richard Epstein calls it, is a, quote, taking, unquote, and therefore unconstitutional. Central to libertarianism is the NAP, which sounds like a Soviet program, uh, but means the non-aggression principle. Each individual is entitled to what he or she owns, and if that person does not give permission for the government to take it away, then any such action by government is coercive. Nowhere, libertarian legal theorists argue, is force more evident than in the principle of eminent domain. Kello versus the city of New London, a, 19, a 2005 U.S. Supreme Court decision, allowed the city of New London to take ownership of private property in order to promote economic development in the town. This, for libertarian, is the Dred Scott decision, a, ter a terrible return to slavery and the use of the power of the state to produce and promote injustice. Libertarians do not generally advocate violence in order to bring about the kind of society they favor. Reading Atlas Shrugged is presumably all that is necessary. But there is a violent side to libertarianism nonetheless. One place it emerges is in the use of language. Libertarians hate, and the hatred is often almost impossible sometimes to keep under control. Rose Wilder Lane once let it slip that she hated Franklin Donna Roosevelt so much that she hoped someone would kill him. Rand's contempt for those inappreciative of the benefits they have illegitimately stolen from the creative class permeates her fiction. In one of the greatest lines ever to appear in a book review, and it appeals to me because I write book reviews and I wish I had written it, the conservative former communist Whitaker Chambers unforgettably saw through Rand's utopianism to the rigid state power that lay behind it. From almost any page of Atlas Shrugged, Whitaker Chambers wrote in National Review, a voice can be heard from painful necessity commanding to the gas chambers, go. Men and women without a conscience, Chambers understood, are capable of doing anything. There is not and cannot ever be anything to restrain the power of acting only in one's self-interest in the world of libertarians. Compare the potential violence of the state 
with the violence required to build gigantic buildings such as Howard Roark built in the Fountainhead, and the latter will every time uh, triumph the former, with the caveat that building any skyscraper in the modern world would require the use of government as an ally. Only in the most fervent imagination of libertarianism are the state and private property so easily distinguishable from each other. Remember that A is always A, and never B. In reality, it is only by seeking the state's power that individuals can find any protection against the rapaciousness to which they are subject in the workplace. Laissez-faire is no state of nature, a beneficial harmony of interests to which we can return if only we get government out of our lives. Far from constituting a refuge from violence, laissez-faire is a regime imposed by force. The only reason the Koch brothers so often seek to elect sympathetic officials, such as the Wisconsin governor and perhaps next president of the United States, Scott Walker, is because they understand the importance of capturing the state and with it its coercive power. The Koch, brother, Koch brothers succeed because, unlike the rest of us, the Koch brothers have sufficient funds to impose their vision of the good society on the rest of us by force. The Koch brothers do not hate the state, they crave it. Far from sharing much in common with liberals, the closest analogy to libertarianism in the history of political philosophy is liberalism's greatest enemy, Carl Schmitt, a Nazi political theorist who's considered a genius by so many political philosophers today. Both Schmitt and Ayn Rand share an adherence to the friend-enemy distinction as good an approximation of the A equals A principle that both can find. Both focus more on times of emergency and times of crisis than on everyday life. No wonder that libertarianisms find in gun rights the ultimate vision of the good society. They are strongest in the South, and especially in those parts of the South whose opposition to racial equality turned into white terrorism. A map of where slavery once existed corresponds almost exactly to a map of where libertarians get elected to public office today. One can find pacifists in the society of friends and among certain Catholic activists. One cannot find pacifists among libertarian activists and thinkers. A movement theoretically opposed to force has no place for those who reject war. At times, a libertarian such as Rand Paul, and I understand that Senator Paul declared uh, his candidacy for the presidency today. And of course, as I hope you know, Rand Paul is named after Ayn Rand. At times, a libertarian such as Rand Paul speaks in the language of isolationism. At other times, especially when, his eye, when he has his eye on the presidency, um, he uh, wants only to be loved by neoconservatives. I also want to say something about what analysts of Puritan preachers and their preachings call declension. Liberalism is sometimes equated, confusingly in my view, with progressivism. Whatever one thinks of that equation, libertarianism, in contrast to both liberalism and protectionism, is, like Puritan theology, declensionist, imagining the world around us as so hopeless, so full of sin, that ultimate redemption seems further and further away. In libertarianism, the state is always growing. Taxes are always rising. Freedom is always being shrunk. And the only hope for, for the world is taking pride in what Albert J. Nock called a remnant. There is a reason why all the good guys in Atlas Shrugged withdraw into their hiding place in the mountains. Libertarianism chooses exit over voice and loyalty. To work with a corrupt, corrupt society is to be corrupted by it. Because of its, uh, of its taste for a declensionist view of the world, liberalism is, libertarianism is, in the United States, politically vulnerable. Americans want to hear a bit of good news every now and then from their candidates for office. Although libertarianism is a much more powerful force than in Europe, any of 
number of libertarians' greatest thinkers, even in America, were European. Hayek, Mises, and Rand, of course, but also Frederick Bastiat, Herbert Spencer, Karl Menger, and Tibor Machan, uh, among numerous others. Isabel Patterson, her great friend, was a Canadian. The pessimism that lovingly clings to libertarianism is somewhat foreign to the sunny optimism that made Ronald Reagan so popular. This is why it's so surprising that Republicans today, especially those committed to libertarianism, turn Reagan into a saint who presumably did no wrong. Such an image is not only contrary to what Reagan actually did, which was to leave the welfare state by and large in place and also to raise taxes on the wealthy, um, but in doing so, Reagan appealed to the better angels of our nature. Both Ayn Rand and Ronald Reagan made their careers in Hollywood. From those years, Reagan learned to smile while Rand inherited everything associated with noir. American preachers, even those associated with evangelical churches, have learned a lesson that escapes proponents of libertarianism. Americans do not want to make too many judgments of others, and they resist others making judgments of them. If uplift has replaced sin in American preaching, terms such as moochers and looters are not so easily avoided among libertarians as Mitt Romney, to his regret, assuming Mitt Romney ever has regrets, discovered with his comment about the 47%. It takes presumably authentic charts and tables to hide the meanness of a Paul Ryan budget. Those who pursue the implications of his budgets, such as Paul Krugman in the Times, cannot be faulted for concluding that Ryan, through his numbers, is a Randian through and through. Americans dislike any notion of a Darwinian struggle of the fittest, even as they vote for politicians who desire nothing more than putting it into place. Perhaps they need the good news delivered to them by their preachers to overcome the bad news delivered by their market-worshipping politicians. In our religion, we welcome God into our hearts. In our politics, if libertarianism uh, uh, is at all influential, we exclude those who are different or in need from our hearts. Finally, I want to talk about uh, monism. Isaiah Berlin, who grew up in much the same way and in some of the exact same places as Ayn Rand, made famous the idea of value pluralism. By all three criteria, he insisted that define a pluralist, libertarianism fails. Libertarianism insists that there is a true answer to all questions in economics and by implication in everything else, that such truths are discoverable through reason and reason alone and will eventually be proven to be correct, and that anything discovered as truthful cannot contradict anything else discovered as truthful. As with the Friedmanites who insist that the free market would have worked in Chile if it had only been given more of a chance, or the current governor of Kansas whose faith in supply-side economics cannot be shaken, no matter how contrary the evidence. Libertarianism can never fail, but can only be failed. There is no trial and error method in libertarianism, only trial and truth. Strikingly modern in many ways, libertarianism has nothing in common with the most modern of all methodologies, the scientific one. The libertarian economist from Vienna evidently did not very much, learn very much from Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, who also came from Vienna. Isaiah Berlin's objection to monism was similar to his objection to totalitarianism. The good society for Berlin was not one that proclaimed itself the embodiment of everything virtuous, a tendency all too common among who those who took the religious idea of one true path and applied it to politics. Berlin wrote under the spell of Immanuel Kant, often citing Kant's dictum that, quote, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Ayn Rand, by contrast, believed that Kant was the most evil, that was her term, the most evil of all the philosophers that ever lived. Behind Rand's sometimes laughable efforts to appear Kant's equal in epistemology, it seems, at least to this reader, that Ram was especially offended by the Kantian moral idea 
of disinterest. Imagine what might happen if we willed our actions to be in conformity with the universal law, in her view, was the first step in the direction of slavery. Rand clearly wanted to be Kant. To do that, evidently, she had to reject him as thoroughly as possible. One does not have to be as extreme as Rand to link monism in theory with monism in practice. Libertarianism, libertarianism goes out of its way to reduce the complexities of the world to one thing and one thing only, whether it be how we make decisions, what decisions we make, and what our decisions imply for others. The oft-noted attraction of libertarianism for young minds is, I believe, a reflection of this. There is something so satisfying when one is young about the Faustian ideal that all of reality can be unlocked with one simple key. It is when we grow out of that fantasy and begin to understand just how complex the world actually is that adherents to libertarianism often begin to realize the limits of what had been so appealing to them. Lastly, I want to say a few words about God. Uh, it's not my place in a conference people with theologians to talk very much about God. This non-believing non-Catholic is going to leave that to the others here today. But I do write in my career, in my life, about religion. And if we are to be pluralists, uh, that must include the non-religious as well. Of libertarians' relationship with atheism, not much need be added. Rand, for one, hated God like she hated Kant, and for much the same reason. This does not mean that all libertarians will do so. There is, for example, a certain kind of libertarianism that appeals to Baptists who, throughout their history, although not necessarily now, rejected the authority of the state, and with it, in their view, all things Catholic. Still, Christian libertarianism is a term one uh, is not a term one commonly hears, not even among right-wing evangelicals. Of course, if Mark Silk is right, uh, we will hear more about spiritual libertarianism, uh, a, a concept he developed, and I think is just a, a wonderful term. Before he became a social Darwinist, William Graham Sumner had been, had been an Episcopal priest. Rejecting the authority of God, he also rejected the authority of the state. In his day, believers in social Darwinism were like the aggressively atheistic Darwins of today, such as Richard Dawkins. For them, life really was a struggle for survival, and one had little choice to find one's place and do one's best. It is because the social Darwinists so strongly endorsed the theory of evolution that religious believers of the time insisted on a Christian ideal of charity as an alternative. Walter Rauschenbusch among the Protestants and Leo XIII among the Catholics filled the gap that social Darwinism had left open. Of course, some liberals, such as Mill, wrote very rarely, vote, wrote very rarely about God. Others, such as T.H. Green and R.H. Tawney, did so frequently. Even John Rawls grew up in a religious home and considered theology as a career. By the way, one of our greatest contemporary liberals, Richard Rorty, was Walter Rauschenbusch's grandson. Liberals, in short, can opt to choose God. Libertarians either cannot or must twist themselves into knots in order to do so. The church, to most libertarians, is just another state. If modern society witnesses a war between science and God, libertarians stand in opposition to both. All of this, I think, helps explain the gyrations of those who insist on being Republican and Christian at the same time. When very few people were looking, save one who managed to get it on tape, Paul Ryan allowed that, quote, the reason I got involved in public life, public service by and large, if I had to credit one thinker, one person, it would be Ayn Rand. After hitting the big time of the Republican vice presidential nomination, Ryan, of course, would change his mind. Now, Ram was only one of the many thinkers who influenced him, and in general, rather than in the specifics, and by the way, not all that much. Cynics think the true Ryan is the one that takes at the shrug as his Bible, and I am among them. As with those who came before him, Rand is too much the social Darwinist to be a significant Catholic force in American political life. As libertarianism had its day, 
As a political force, perhaps not. Democracy requires an opposition party. As the ideology of those in opposition, libertarianism appeals because it's relentlessly oppositional by nature. But democracy also requires ideals to live by. And that, I think, is where the severe limits of libertarianism are revealed. Of course, it may prove to be true that Americans will remain comfortable with a dysfunctional political system, preferring nothing, however frustrating, to anything, no matter how desirable. But if they do ever long once again for leadership, and in so doing regain at least a modicum of trust in governance, whoever governs them will need something more than a political philosophy so cruel. Thank you. So I'm just following orders, but I'm told that <laughs> I should call on people with questions, which I'm happy to do. Though also one point of clarification, Rand Paul was not called, named after Ayn Ayn Rand. His name's Randall. That's a myth on the internet. But read everything you believe on the internet. New York Times, U.S. <laughs> News, and several other reputable uh, newspapers. So I'm going to believe them. But as a, that's a, that, that, that's an aside. You were mentioning the hidden or implied authoritarian, tyrannical underlying pins of libertarian thought. And what came to my mind is that that doesn't seem very different than, frankly, the same issues within much liberal thought, at least in practice. What comes to mind is Jacksonian democracy and the Cherokees, or just eugenics, which Gray is proponent, one can say, legally speaking, Buck v. Bell with Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes writing that majority opinion, one page, or in terms of the Native American education where they forcibly removed the children from their homes to be properly Europeanized, and anyone who opposed these ideas were seen to be anti-reason and anti-progress. I'm not defending libertarianism really in, in this end, but it, is, it seems like, in a very strange sense, both have hidden authoritarian tendencies. Would that uh -huh. be accurate? Thanks, I think it's a very good question, and I would actually accept a lot of what you said, uh, with a proviso that many of your examples, now this may just seem like a technical thing, but many of those examples, such as the unfortunate Holmes quote, are examples of progressivism rather than liberalism. I think there's a real authoritarian strain in progressivism. And that progressivism shares much of the critique. That progress means that there we go, we have a specific place we want to get there, and we want to get there as fast as possible. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, for example, the quintessential progressive, had that ruthless side to him as well, that, that absolutely rigid, moral, A is A, B is B kind of outlook on the world. And I think much of progressive foreign policy shared that you know, same kind of thing with it. Like, so I'm using a distinction, as I said in the talk, between progressivism and liberalism. I, in one of the paragraphs I said, you know, sometimes liberalism is confused with progressivism. I don't think it should be. Uh, for me, liberalism is uh, much more about trying to find something that works in a kind of do and try and go this way and go that way sort of way, uh, more like the, the, the approach of American pragmatism which is very, very different than the progressivism. And so it's a trial and error method. And as some writers have said, uh, uh, libertarianism really tries to be principled. Um, and that, that's a big thing if you can show that your principles are consistent. I don't find that in liberalism. I don't find this, uh, and, in, uh, and in many political philosophers associated with liberalism either. This that uh, put principle first, get everything consistent, make it all logically powerful and hang together is not the way I think of liberals, either, either in philosophy or in their political practice. I think of actually much more like Obama, you know, try this, try that, negotiate, try to, you know, and, and Obama often gets attacked for being not resolute and, and, you know, for, well, these days he's being attacked on foreign policy. To me, that's the essence of of liberalism, that you don't want to get imprisoned by your own principles. You want things to work. And if a deal with Iran can work, then you push it because it can work. And you don't, you avoid these, is this appeasement, and so on. So I hope that clarifies it.
Thanks. Uh, I'm interested very much in the, in the way in which you stress the kind of authoritarianism of libertarianism. I mean, this sounds like a self-contradiction, yeah. but I, I'd like to get a little further clarification on what you're really arguing here. And are you saying that the libertarian have such a commitment to the principles of free market or laissez-faire that they'll use any force and power to implement that, uh, to just say we're going to stick with that and that only? Uh, or, uh, or is it, are there some other, other commitments? Um, you, you have a very strong argument that libertarians have a, a sort of uh, an absolute certitude about their commitment to the right way to do things. And that one right way is that the market and the rules of the market, and therefore anybody who violates those are going to be thrown in jail. Or I, I, how this fits, you know, how you put together the commitment to freedom, which mm -hmm. is seen as at most libertarians would tell you that that's what they're committed to. And but your analysis of pushing toward this very rigid, rule-governed, and authoritarian orientation. Can you clarify a little further about how those two go together in the way you're analyzing libertarianism? Well, I can try. I mean, I, I think, you know, I could sort of take what I think would be an easy way out, which you suggested in context of your question, and say that what's authoritarianism about libertarianism is this principle, this insistence on one way and one way only, um, you know, that it, it, it rejects this notion that there may be many different ends or many different aspects of, of human flourishing. So in that sense, uh, I mean, I think if you, you know, back in uh, when I started my career, the most controversial book in the social sciences we read was a book called The Authoritarian Personality, uh, published by T.W. Adorno and other thinkers. And in the aftermath of Nazism, they had tried to develop a psychological test that would measure the authoritarian personality. And it became hugely controversial. It was the methodology right. I mean, I always sort of believed that, that there might be some, some such thing as an authoritarian personality. So if I were to really take your question uh, and, you know, answer it, a little more controversial, I, I think these people that I'm describing are temperamentally authoritarian. I, I think that they, they, there is something about their personality. That's why they're always getting into these sectarian arguments. That's why they're always reading other people out. It really seems to me to be the, the almost essence of a my way or the highway uh, kind of approach. And, and so I think they're literally authoritarian. If we mean by that, um, people who both understand the world to be one thing and one thing only, and will then begin to justify almost any tactic, even those that seem to contradict their principles uh, in order to do that. Now, that, that may be partially autobiographical on my part, and if you'll forgive that, um, you know, in the 60s, like a lot of other people my age, I was really attracted to left-wing political causes and joined various left-wing political movements. And, you know, I still remember those meetings. Of, there were people in those meetings. They always stayed longer than everybody else, you know, because they could win the vote if everyone else left. And, and they were just ruthlessly um, pursuing their particular agenda in a very much like a Leninist kind of way. They, they read about the Russian Revolution and they learned, you know, how to, how to sort of manipulate organizations. Um, those are the people I see these days as libertarians. It's the same kind of disposition. Um, I wonder if there aren't people who are both in some way, just as there are former leftists who turned right wing, you know, whether there were people who may have been libertarians and they're now, you know, in some other variety of conservatism with an explicit rather than an implicit authoritarian bent. But I'm trying to get at features like that. Uh, so I don't know if that helps you, but. I copied down a, a fragment of a sentence, so I, I don't know for sure that I heard it correctly or, or have it in context, but it, it's uh, something pre preceding it. And then say, people have to be sufficiently mature and knowledgeable to put liberty to good use. Um, 
looking that at... That is, they have to go through a process of self-development, what the Germans like von Humboldt called Bildung, or cultivation of your intelligence. Okay, so they did understand it. So looking at it just as a citizen standpoint, not someone belong, you know, involved in politics or political theory or intellectual comment, this is a, I anyway, consider myself a reasonably intelligent person, but this is really hard to do. To, I mean, in terms of being, being able to make well-informed judgments in terms of everything that's going on, the complexities, particularly in the economic realm. So I guess what my question is, is what sets the bar for that? I, I recently read an article citing H.L. Mencken and um, uh, Walter Lippmann that had this sort of very elitist intellectual idea of the uh, highbrow versus the middlebrow or mm -hmm. the hoi polloi. And so how does one describe and cultivate people sufficiently mature and knowledgeable to put liberty to good use? Well, there have been a lot of people who tried. I, I think probably the most uh, interesting example may be uh, the work of a Harvard psychologist named Lawrence Kohlberg who was strongly influenced by Kant and by the idea of having, you know, I, I'm using the word mature. I know that sounds like, you know, well, I'm saying, are you saying I'm immature kind of, kind of coming, but you, you, you can work on your moral development uh, until you reach a point where you understand things in a more complex way. Uh, Kant, I mean, um, Kohlberg, I don't think was religious as far as I know, but I think there are a lot of theologians and maybe here's some people from theology can help me that would have a similar kind of perspective of getting a deeper understanding of the world. And, and so it's that general tendency that I'm describing. And it can sound elitist. It can sound like you're saying, well, you know, those southern truck drivers who eat, you know, barbecued corn or whatever uh, and, and or, or vote for the Republicans and, you know, uh, say horrible things about immigrants that they just haven't achieved. This. But I'm not willing to say there isn't some truth in that. Um, there may be an edge of elitism in my remarks. Personally, I don't think there are anything nearly as elitist as Rand and others who, you know, dismiss the you know, people uh, um, uh, because they haven't grown until they see her point of view. But I'm not reluctant. I mean, I'm, I don't want to let go of that idea, um, which is maybe in some sense anti-democratic, that everybody's ideas are equally morally valid. Uh, it would seem to me there'd be no point for theology and no point for moral philosophy if, if that's where you begin. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alan, for a terrific talk. I appreciate it. Don't knock barbecue corn. Uh, it's, it's good <laughs> <I> stuff. <know. laughs> and truck drivers are terrific too. Um, so I'm I'm taken by a number of things in in your talk that I don't know that we have time to go back to, um, but um, one of them was that you mentioned that you thought that uh, libertarians tended to assume a certain form of human nature without evidence. And could you expand a little bit on what that is? Is that atomistic, um, self-serving? property guarding, uh, family loving, or is it is it something else? Because that gets to a second uh, question about the possibility of religious libertarians, uh, Christian libertarians, or whatever. Um, because a lot of the, the, the boundary line of folks who are uh, professed to be Catholic and libertarian today are those who don't see the church as another state, but rather as something wholly um, uh, voluntary, something that we choose and is non-coercive and therefore the sort of affectations that they might find to be natural are put forth in the proper place, you know, in a non-coercive environment. That's why we should rely on uh, voluntary organizations to provide for all the things that we need. Um, and I'm wondering if there's, what sort of nature to politics line you're drawing there? Well, if those with whom I had lunch will forgive me, I, um, I, I was trying to expound on this at lunch, and so I came up with this idea that I can think of three different kinds of ways of being libertarian. Uh, one would be that uh, you believe that government has no role in helping us, but you recognize that every now and then there'll be an act of God or something that's totally outside a choice you make, like a tornado or a hurricane, and under those limited circumstances, you could accept government intervention. 
And then I could see a second kind of libertarian that says, no, even if there's an act of God, you know, government is always going to mess it up. Government is always going to get it wrong. So you should rely on voluntary help, churches and so on, uh, and provide help that way. And then the third kind of libertarian I associate with Ayn Rand, which is no help whatsoever. Any kind is the proper libertarian response because altruism is always a false uh, uh, sympathy is always wrong, altruism is wrong, and just let them, you know, life is tough. Some people, the hurricane, that's it, you know. So there, there would be different kinds of ways. Now, you know, you could never get by with an Ayn Rand kind of thing in this country. That's why Ryan, you know, has done what he did with respect to that. Um, but I think there's, for some at least, there really is this underlying dimension um, that the problem is help. You know, it's just the idea of helping people. It's just offensive, I, I think, to certain kinds of libertarians. Um, so, you know, uh, while I said in my talk, I think you can talk about libertarianism as one thing, there are obviously different roots and different strands. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, if you think about it for a while, um, maybe you could see where, because we love the idea that if the state doesn't come to people's help, people will do so voluntarily and charity. Uh, and out of charity, but I can see all kinds of people who just don't like, like the idea of charity. I don't, I don't know if that, but that's what I meant by, you know, a kind of super rationality, a, a rationality that you can see in some of the extremes of libertarian thinking. Like, for example, probably the best example of libertarian economic thinking that certainly became controversial, and it is the reason why one of the most brilliant minds in America will never serve on the US Supreme Court is the University of Chicago professor Richard Posner, who served as a federal judge and wrote this famous article about the market and babies and how we could solve the problem of abortion, we could solve the problem of villages, all these things would go away if just there were a free market and babies. And a woman who was poor and needed money would gladly sell her baby to get the money, and somebody else who had money but was infertile would buy the baby, and this would be the perfect society. Now, what kind of uh, understanding of human nature really is that. Um, po Posner to his, I really like Richard Posner. I think he's, you know, he's since recanted his libertarianism and has become one of libertarianism's best critics. But what was he thinking? <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, it's, maybe he was being honest. Maybe he didn't believe it. Last one, or, yeah. Oh, Brandon, go ahead. Can, do you need the mic? Well, pity, pity that table. They're all in my class that was supposed to meet today. See, but <laughs> good afternoon, professor. Huh? Good afternoon, professor. You you had talked about in in your speech the uh, the idea of the narrative of declension that is most commonly associated with uh, Enlightenment era conservatives such as De Maistre and Burke. Um, and we see that today in either modern conservative and as in libertarianism, as you pointed out. Do we see that narrative, or at least a similar version of it in modern liberalism today? Say a liberal yeah. believes that, um, oh, people today are much more selfish and much more aligned with libertarian philosophy and therefore uh, contribute less to civil service or to charity or to any other charitable endeavor that I believe you answered in the previous question. Like, do we see the same kind of mentality, but maybe just less pronounced as with libertarianism? Yeah, thank you. I, that's a very good question, and the answer is very much yes. Um, Mary Jo and I were talking about Robert Putnam, the Harvard social scientist, and Bowling Alone, its famous classic, can be viewed as a, as a declensionist lament. We used to bowl together, now we don't. Uh, it, it was filled with that kind of, and uh, you know, he, he takes great care, I think, not to identify himself too explicitly with any political tendency and so on, but I, I do think it represents um, 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 that, exactly that kind of thing. Probably the greatest declensionist that I can think of was someone who began on the left but then wound up in an indeterminate political space, and he was a historian and great social critic named Christopher Lash. And all of his books were written with the sense we once had vibrant neighborhoods, vibrant communities, but now it's all going down. So yeah, I think the declensionist style covers every aspect of, of the political spectrum. And I, you know, I, I'm sometimes subject to it. 
Uh, I, I sort of, everything I write, I try to don't get into that kind of thing, but sometimes I can't help myself, you know? I, I hate to tell you guys, but you know, there's no better music than classical music and opera, and if you don't know it, you are just, it's, the world is falling apart. You think that stuff you listen to is music? I mean, so, I'll stop. And by the way, sports were much better in the old days, too. <laughs> I have a question to kind of put you a little bit at odds with, with uh, the first Alan's talk, uh, where he said he, he uh, uh, objected to the title of the uh, uh, symposium, which you clearly embrace, yeah. that, that liberal, libertarianism is not compatible with liberalism. I guess my question is the famous, we, we have the definition of heresy is a truth that is run amok. Is that the libertarian, is, is, Alan Ryan write that libertarianism is, is a truth of liberalism run amok. Mm -hmm. And if so, is it, 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 are you, are, does it lead though, because of these essentially almost psychological traits that you're discussing, produce this thing that is now incompatible? What, what is that, what's the answer to the question on our programs? Thank you. I'm, I, I would like, do you want to comment first? I mean, I was just going to say that I'd like us both to be correct. Uh, because you are, I think, indisputably the master of contemporary political philosophy, and I'm more interested in, like, the psychological sort of aspects of it, and so I, I think it can be quite right that at the level of ideas, Alan Ryan is right. Um, I was looking more at motivations, at underlying um, things that I think aren't necessarily reflected in the ideas, per se, of libertarian, but in the method. And for me, the method is profoundly at odds with a liberal method of doubt, empiricism, investigation, and so on. Alan, are you going to? Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was going to resolutely keep quiet. <laughs> um, but having been sort of dragged in, uh, I'd better say something. Um, <clears throat> my thought is that, in principle at least, it's surely the case that if you take the libertarian notion of self-ownership, you know, me and my stuff is mine, then it leaves what one proposes to do with it off the table. Um, this is my bicycle. What that means is nobody else can use it except with my permission. But what I use it for, I might use it to go and deliver meals on wheels. I might, on the other hand, use it to, I don't know, uh, go and visit somebody else's wife when I shouldn't. Um, all kinds of stuff I might use it for, but the crucial thing they insist on is that it's my bike because it's my bike. And I thought myself that you were jamming together uh, two bits of the story, one of which is the kind of Ayn Randian version which makes egoism a positive virtue and regards anything else as being sort of feeble and generally disgusting, um, with, as it were, the Nozickian sort of philosophically mm. purer version, um, which says that what's crucial is the notion that each person is a separate enterprise. Each person therefore has propriety rights over the, themselves, their ideas, and the things they need to run that particular personal enterprise. And although it may just be wishful thinking to think that people who aren't dragooned too much into cooperating will more readily voluntarily cooperate it's not actually a story about sort of pure rock-ribbed egoism. And I think by the same token, I think the Hayekian bit, um, it's not so much as it were that clever people understand how everything works and Tom, Dick and Harry don't. I think it's much more that in the Hayekian version, none of us, I mean the whole point of a catalexy is precisely that none of us understand how all the various bits fit together. And what Hayek is wanting to say, much of the time, some of the time, 
um, is simply that you're better off being at the mercy of an abstract system, which you don't see fully into, than you are being at the mercy of, so to speak, you know, the third assistant commissar for the distribution of breakfast, uh, where you have to be nice to somebody, subservient to somebody, in order to get the things you need to survive. So, I think, had I been sort of parked there to sit there and criticize what you were saying, I think I'd have nagged at you down that track um, and accused you of said, putting too many people together. But as to the behavior of people like the Koch brothers, I mean, to be against the state, but to propose to spend, what is it, 817 million? Some such number, in order to secure as much of the state as possible for your Republican friends. I mean, that's a very, very funny way of carrying on. <laughs> and to sort of I mean, we shall take over the state in order to destroy it. It sounds rather like sort of me lie or something. I mean, it's just horrible. And so that, I absolutely side with you all the way down on that. Um, but I think purely doctrinally, I think I'd have soft pedaled it a bit. Well, I, I would only respond. It's what he wanted to say. <laughs> no, I just, I, I need to just respond to one thing, I think, and that is with respect to Hayek. I mean, there I would say that the liberal tradition grows out of the Kantian imperative of superiority, that dare to know, dare to understand a very Enlightenment-inspired idea. But Hayek's point that the market and is so complex that we can't ever understand it. Again, I would say the libertarian is more toward that, and the liberal is more toward understanding and the need for it. But that's all. I would still separate them.